Yeah, so um, three years ago I fell um, at a wedding and um, fell straight on the top of my head uh, on the dance floor and ended up breaking my C5 and C6 vertebrae and I was instantly paralyzed basically from the shoulders down. Um, then when you end up in this situation, you know, one of the first things you do is try and figure out ways out of it and start, and so you start um, doing research into the field and into the science and things like that. And of course, everyone talks to you about stem cells and it's the greatest buzzword and everyone says, well, keep an eye on stem cells. Stem cells, they're doing great things with stem cells. Like, they'll have something for you soon and it's only going to be four years, three years. Um, you know, you're told about all these different time frames. And then of course, you start Googling these things and you start researching it yourself. And it's, it's miraculous because as soon as you start Googling it, all of a sudden, all of these ads pop up and they start promising you cures and treatments for not just spinal cord injury, for every disease really. Um, so, you know, I, I'm a relative, come from a relatively technical background, so I started looking into all these things and trying to understand how they could help me, what the mechanisms were. Um, and you know what I could use to help myself um, and I was you know kind of dubious and skeptical of these things um, and the more I dug into it all and the more I contacted the people that were purporting to sell these treatments the more I, I kind of smelled a bit of a rat really and uh, found a lot of kind of fundamental issues with what they were what they were promising one thing for instance would be that they would use the same intervention for every disease. So if you had Parkinson's, if you had a heart disease, spinal cord injury, a stroke, cerebral palsy, whatever the hell it was you wanted to be cured of, they could cure you using the same interventions. And they would charge you quite handsomely for that, uh, for that pleasure. Um, so then I, I um, you know, came across the Irish Stem Cell Foundation and I got involved and um, one of the things that, that we worked on there was, or we are working on, is to try and educate people about the scams that are out there um, and about the fact that this, um, this, this country in particular has a lack of legislation that actually allows so good, legitimate science to, to move forward and to go ahead. Um, and that's one of the things that, that we're big believers in trying to make happen. So my point is, is there that it's people like me and people like the patient groups and the people with the diseases. We have got to understand this problem. We've got to own the problem. We've got to make it ourselves. And we have to move ourselves forward to treatments for ourselves. We can't rely on legislation. You can't rely on the government. And that is why like this field of stem cell medicine or regenerative medicine, when you start learning about the capabilities that this science has, it is really, really, it's inspiring and it's, it's mind blowing. So I encourage everyone to, to, to learn more about that science. Do you think it's not happening because of what you explained about the money side of things, that there's no real incentive there? Is that the reason? I think that's a very big part of it. Yeah, I mean, I think that if, we, if the whole field was run by, by a disease group, we'd be moving these fields forward. Like look at AIDS, right? The AIDS guys are the example that I always give. They did such an incredible job of making their voice heard, making their, pro their, their kind of disease be something that was on everybody's lips. If people, if the groups that have these issues have the problems, if we come together and we move the field forward and we own, we've got to own the conversation like the AIDS guys did. From the media perspective, you know, you hear these stories or you see like these kind of front page headlines where like someone's going for a uh, miracle stem cell treatment and they, you know, they're raising money for, that's fine, they, they, people should raise money for them, for, for, for these situations, but, or not for the stem cell, but, you know, to help themselves. But what has the media done after these stories? Does the media follow up a year later? 
it, it absolutely, I believe it has a, a, you know, a requirement to do that. It, it should do that. If you write a story on some, someone having some miraculous stem cell and going off to you know, some country, weird country for this stuff, um, and you don't follow up a year later, you don't follow up six months later, you don't follow up two years later, you're perpetuating the, 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 the problem, which is, is we don't have any data on whether any of this stuff works. And that means that all we have is scientists saying, oh, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But we don't want to believe scientists. When you're lying, lying in your bed and you, you're told you'll never walk again, you'll never feed yourself again, and the, and the doctors are coming and telling you, oh, yeah, that's true, that's true. You don't want to believe it. You don't believe it. You simply don't believe it because you can't, you know, give up that easily. So you find, you you fight to try and find what is out there. And you find these charlatans selling you hope for that absolutely false hope. So you go, you go, and you get the money, and you you go. And then you never hear about the stories where, by a year later, there's no improvement. A year later, you know, in reality, the people when they're really honest, more than anything, I would love to believe that these things work. Trust me, I really want to believe that they work. But they don't. I mean, and I've spoken to countless people who, who have come to these things, and they'll tell you that, like, like one on one when you get in trouble. But like, the media should be following this up with this, and the media should be reporting. I mean, the inter the interesting thing is that you know you have you know various programs like sixty minutes, for example, that can catch individuals uh, who make completely ridiculous um, claims to patients and take them for large amounts of money. But you can only pick off a very small number of the total number of clinics that are out there because there's so much money to be made um, you know th that there are now hundreds of clinics throughout the world and for example the largest research organization in the world set up a website where uh, it was going to publish scientific data about all these treatments that were offered by clinics so they, they wrote to every single clinic that was popularly used uh, by patients asking them for valid scientific you know independently verifiable data and in unison what most of these clinics did because they have large amounts of reserves cash for taking large amounts of money and doing very little for the patient they have they can afford large teams of lawyers uh, now that can uh, you know basically threaten to sue these you know relatively small research organizations and certainly one of the things that uh, you know the foundation has come across is a, is a fear of litigation. So you're coming out and you're, you're, you're spelling out you know, medical fact, but then you'll get a kind of a nasty letter. And, and also when you're talking to the media about spe uh, specific clinics, reporters, you say this clinic X in, in China is, is you know, it's killing patients. They're very reluctant to actually publish the name of the clinic because that you know, opens them to litigation. So it's kind of a, an evolving problem. I mean, there's a huge difference between the road, uh, if you go, you know, the clinical trial route, like for example, this year, uh, or sorry, last year, um, uh, an American uh, bio, uh, bio, biotech company had to shut down a clinical trial because of financial concerns. So it's kind of, you know, it's very easy to set up a scam clinic. It's actually very difficult to bring a potential new treatment to, uh, to you know, to fruition costs an awful lot of money and this is one of the big problems now a lot like with the recession a lot of companies that are running for example clinical trials using stem cells into spinal injury their you know their their share price or their you know disposable income is drying up very quickly and you know they're cutting down programs which is slowing down the research so you know again it points to the you know the greater education and ultimately directed philanthropy being the, cute, more important. I think it's a terrible pity that we always talk about all these scam things that are going on. When we're not talking about what this science and this regenerative technologies and stem cell medicine will actually be able to deliver. I mean, there's, there's no doubt in the overall scientific community's mind that this stuff is revolutionary and it will it is going to change the world, like I mean.
you mentioned then the AIDS thing and what they did there. I mean, they camped outside the FDA building or something. It's not the story, basically. Yeah. And so why don't you do that? Same well, I thing. do. I do. I mean, I talk to the FDA. I complain to the FDA, and um, I travel around the world and I get in front of these people, and I'm in front of you guys today, trying to sell this message. I think just. From the researcher's point of view, I think it's important to point out why scientists like myself are so uh, excited about stem cell technology. And it's because if you know the history uh, by which people have tried to cure human disease, a large part of the problem is scarcity of material. Uh, and what stem cells uh, provide is you know, an ability to get large amounts of, of different cell types. So for example, if you're interested in, in spinal injury, you can grow neurons from stem cells. And this is huge to, to, uh, to a researcher because the amount of material you have to study uh, directly informs the, the degree of resolution or the quality of your data that you come out with. So, you know, you know I think a lot of people would say, oh, scientists are always going on about why you know, stem cells are great. And they are great, uh, but ultimately the utility of them has yet to be fully realized. And we don't know whether that utility will be realized in a year, 10 years, 50 years, or 100 years. Because ultimately, this is the problem, you know, research is inherently, inheritably uh, unpredictable. Um, so, you know, when, you, when you're a researcher talking to the public, you have, you know, you're almost talking through both sides of your mouth, and you're telling people to be excited about stem cell research, but then you're also trying to temper that enthusiasm with a, realist, uh, a realistic uh, appreciation of how difficult these things are. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very difficult thing to, to tell people with diseases, you know, that like, you've got to be in this for the long haul. You know, when we say stem cell treatments, some cell tra stem cell treatments are quite old and they've been around for 40, 50 years. But in, in many cases, uh, you know, the, the stem cell treatments that we now hope to, you know, generate from pluripotent stem cells, for example, they could be, well, like, you know, uh, six to a hundred years away, depending on the complexity of the disease. So, you know, it's kind of, the more you get into it, the more complicated it becomes. And a lot of these things are too difficult to communicate in a soundbite, which is why, you know, we're kind of repeatedly going against the brick wall and not really penetrating and informing the, the public uh, to the degree we would like to. In the Gerrans case is that they were the first to do their that kind of treatment and ultimately, all the framework, the regulatory frameworks that you know would protect uh, the patient while you know allowing the science to move forward, they were all being developed during the you know the the Geron, uh, interaction. Uh, so, like I mean, the, the next companies that come along, they the framework is already there. So, while it's extremely disappointing that the clinical trial was closed down, it's not a complete loss in that like the framework by which other companies can come along now. I mean, the other thing that, like, cell replacement therapies, we've only talked about cell replacement therapies really so far, but a lot of researchers, including myself, think that uh, products will come to the clinic quicker. Are you familiar with this yeah, yeah, so that's a drug. So that's a drug that they discovered using, using the cells. So, so for example, in, in Martin's case, so if you're thinking about curing spinal injury, right, you can think about it by introducing... Uh, the cells that are damaged into the spinal cord. Or you could think of, for example, using stem cells to make the various cell types present in the, stem uh, in the spinal cord, and then finding drugs that would either A, stop the cells dying, or even better, cause the cells to proliferate, for example, or increase their functionality. So what you never really get in the media is the idea that stem cells are this amazing research tool that can indirectly push things forward, because you've got these huge banks of what are called orphan drugs that have been tried in very specific conditions and they've passed toxicity tests. And now with stem cells as a new platform for making many different cell types, you could try those orphan drugs in those in different contexts. So for example, a lot of these drugs have, you know, they, they hit uh, what are called signal transduction pathways, which can have many, many different effects depending on what type of cell and what type of condition they're in. So that that's really interesting. Yeah. It's, it's still and, and I think the, the other thing, besides drug screening, you've got what's called disease modeling. And that's where you take cells and you put them in a the petri dish, and they're rather like having a cartoon of a disease. 
So you can, you know, you can't really go into somebody, you can't ask somebody who's, you know, suffering from Alzheimer's and they're, they're deteriorating. You can't study that as a, a, as a researcher by, you know, taking biopsies repeatedly out of the patient's head because they'll only get worse. But if you can take a stem cell and then make the, the brain cells that are damaged in Parkinson's disease, you can watch that in a dish and compare it to what's a normal cell like compared to a Parkinson's cell. And that's, that, that, that's an amazing way of, of, of dealing with, the, with the, these kind of conditions that are quite complex and, and go on for a long period of time. So while cell replacement therapies are simplistic in, in, you know, in concept, I think that you know, we shouldn't forget the indirect routes by which we could get better drugs and understand more about disease and injury. How does the Irish Stem Cell Foundation, um, what, is, what do you see as the priority? If we had the legislative framework that we badly need in Ireland, mm -hmm. what, would you, what would be the next first step? Because there are so many steps to be taken. Well, what would be the next first step? I, I, think, I think if we had better resources, there would be much, much deeper education. Like, for example, we've no stem cell biology on, uh, on an intercert or leaving cert. And if you just taught a little bit biology to the students, I think more people would be able to, s s you know, see something real from scans, for example, and that's something that would take, you know, a page, a page in a textbook. But I think, you know, uh, there's a very serious problem in Ireland with, the, with regards to a legislative vacuum, and we'd be hearing from various people, and and an inability almost to formulate policy, uh, in areas that are politically sensitive, and this is dragging on. Like I mean, you you have, you know, stem cells is just ultimately, and embryonic stem cells in particular, is just a very visible uh, area where you point to a much larger vacuum and, uh, you know, you know, under development of policy. And, you know, it's kind of, the way I see it actually is, is, is quite in a, in a David uh, McWilliams kind of way. I think in the Celtic Tiger, we threw lots of money into this area. We didn't develop policy. And ultimately, the question then becomes like, do you get a good result? Do you get competitive, meaningful, definitive research out of something that doesn't have uh, an international standard? I mean, if Ireland, I'm very passionate that Ireland should not have an Irish standard of stem cell research. This is a complete waste of resources. And there's like this lack of legislation also completely isolates Irish researchers, which is completely, it's, it, it's the worst thing researchers can be in is in isolation because like for example if you're if you're to make a real effort towards uh, pushing something to the clinic for a spinal injury or neurodegenerative disease that's going to take hundreds of labs with really really smart people in them to, to get something that means something to a patient and the idea that Ireland can you know contribute to the international efforts by having a legislative vacuum is is a nonsense in my view. Mm -hmm.